Okay, well, uh, I found out, I discovered I was a polyglot by a sheer chance. It's a savant ability. It has nothing to do with the intellect or the degree of intelligence, anything like that. Um, and it's probably a result of growing up in a multilingual uh, family setting uh, with Italian on one side and English on the other. Um, so uh, eventually, after studying uh, ancient Greek and Armenian, uh, Persian, Georgian, Ossetian, I ended up working on some languages from around the uh, eastern shore of the Black Sea, from Sochi area uh, up to uh, Sea of Azov, that area like that. Um, and these are uh, called Circassian, uh, Ubuch, and Abkhazian. And I just had this weird talent for making all the sounds that these languages have. Um, and what these languages have done it's sort of the mirror image of what almost every other set of languages on earth do. Uh, as far as we know now, there are 32 languages that, that do what Circassian and, and Ubuch and Abkhaz do. Um, and all the other 7,000 or so <laughs> do what English does. Uh, and that is that, you know, you assimilate, you articulate so that you sort of slur things together and you assimilate a consonant to the following vowel. So you can go k and car, that's a regular standard k, or you can go k in key, for example, or you can go qu and cool, and you ignore the k, you ignore the k, you, because they're predictable, and you hear simply k, but it's actually a different sound, right? Well, what these languages do, no, 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 they don't assimilate the consonant to the vowel, they assimilate the vowel to the consonant. <laughs> so, for them, k is different from k is different from qu, <laughs> and they have qu, and they have qu, and another one even has qu, and as well, um, and so uh, there are all these very fine, fine differences that are ignored in most languages, and uh, uh, where the the information burden is put on the vowel. Now in these languages, they have uh and uh. <laughs> they have two vowels, and then all the information is put on the consonants. So post that and they just seem to, to go bananas they go crazy and uh, making sounds so for example if I spoke to you in West Circassian say the Bjadol dialect and there I have a friend down at Western University from Syria he's a professor now at Western speaks Bjadol his, his family does um, I would have a S say and I would have a sh, and I would have a sh, and I would have a sh that comes in two flavors sh and sh. <laughs> And then I would have a sh, and it comes in two flavors, sh and sh. And why stop there? It also has a sh and a gl, and the sh comes as sh and sh. <laughs> like, we're not done, we're halfway there. There's a sh and a sh, and a sh and a sh, and it has a sh. <laughs> uh, so, uh, they're phonetically enormously rich, but actually not just phonetically, in terms of cognition, in terms of actually hearing the sounds and paying attention to these sounds. They are cognitively very rich, too. And some of us speculate that, in fact, they're pushing some kind of human maximum. Um, we do find click languages, and they'll have over 100 distinct sounds, and, and about 80 of which are clicks, and then there's another 30 or 40 regular sounds. That's getting way up there, but it has a special mechanism for, for making distinctions. But if you don't have that kind of special mechanism, we're looking here at languages that have six, 67, 72, 81 consonants. There's one on the other side of, of the mountains uh, uh, going east of Sochi that has 91 um, consonants. So we're beginning to think that this is a kind of human maximum of some sort. Um, but they're pushing the limits of the human ability to, to hear sound and to hear language. Uh, so it makes them interesting. And uh, the fact that they do stuff uh, in a mirror image fashion uh, is also theoretically important for, for the theory of, of, of how one organizes uh, the grammar of sound, which we call phonology. Right? But you know, we even have it here uh, in Cree, uh, up, uh, First Nation language up, up just north of here. And so Wigwam. Uh, the G <laughs> in Wigwam is actually K in Cree, and it comes after a long vowel, so we Kiwaman is the Cree, and after a long vowel, the K becomes a G automatically. They don't hear it. They hear a K. Okay. So now in English, we have the opposite. We say bat or bad 
the vowel in front of the D is longer than the vowel in front of the T, just by about 30%. But you can sort of hear it. And um, it's for standard English dialect pronunciation. It's missing, say, in Indian English. It makes one of the, the, the hearing in Indian English somewhat difficult for uh, people who are outside India. Um, so in English, the vowels lengthen in front of a voicing contrast. In Cree, it becomes voiced after a long vowel. So it's this mirror image, mirror image trade-off. So even here in our own languages, we have something like this. So um, yeah, and well, speaking of own languages, now we have 200 families that speak Circassian here. They're Canadian citizens that come in from Syria as refugees. And they have New Year's. I can hear all the dialects and <laughs> Happy New Year and so forth. Um, um, Happy New Year's, Yislash, Yislash, Choch, Nachoch, Nachoch, Yislash Nachoch. That's not a no, it's a Choch. <laughs> so that's how they work. And um, um, it's interesting. And, and I translated a lot of myths from, the, from these uh, languages. I had a lot of help from, from speak, older speakers that, that uh, wanted to help and told me this is a good myth, we should translate this one. And, uh, there was some, uh, there were fun times uh, doing that. I must say, it was a grand, a grand experience. It's been a grand experience with very strange languages. I tell you. <laughs> so, so how do you say thank you in Circassian? Uh Well, thank you, John. <laughs>